look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you that we can gather, we can learn about you, Lord. We can study your word that you've given us for our benefit and um, to know you better. We pray, Lord, that as we um, study this, that our hearts and minds would be the friends to receive what you teach us. And that we would remember to remember these things as we go through the week. We pray this in Jesus' name. So this morning we were going to continue on um, in Matthew chapter 5, which was just three weeks ago we did um, the Beatitudes, uh, the first first of the Beatitudes, the first set. But I'd like uh, to go back and read those over again. So if we can open to Matthew 5, right in the beginning. And let's start in verse 3. I just want to reread uh, re these so that we remember the things that Jesus talked about as far as what was really um, characteristics of a follower of Jesus, um, virtues, um, of what it really meant, what in your heart to be a believer and follower of Jesus. And these are the characteristics that he describes and, of course, blessings associated with each one of them. So we'll start in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And that's as far as we went last week. And we're going to continue on with this. Now, these uh, Beatitudes, you know, they, like I said, they describe virtues of the righteous. And we describe what these really mean. So sometimes on the surface, you read them and you might get an impression, but we went into some detail as what that really meant. So they give promises um, of blessing to those with peaceful hearts and who have sorrow for sin and that kind of thing. The next two Beatitudes also give promise of blessings. But the circumstances that bring about the blessings are not so comforting, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> as you'll see. So we we'll move on to the next one in Matthew 5, 10. It said, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember the other one now, <clears throat> it had, the first one we read, is also for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But this one, <clears throat> to get there, doesn't sound like a lot of fun, so we might not rather participate in it if we can avoid it. But it's, um, <clears throat> it is still a blessing, and it's something that if we try and shy away from being persecuted, we kind of shy away from that blessing too. Because people that are truly following um, Jesus will be persecuted, even if it's just verbally and, you know, people um, ridicule you and make fun of you and that kind of thing. If you're standing up for the Lord and letting people know that, you know, persecution will follow. So, I'm sure I turned my phone off here. I know you reminded me, but just want to make sure it is. Okay. All right, so. One thing that is always kind of, I've always kind of wondered about, is questioned about, and didn't make a lot, that's not logical at all. Why would people of the world persecute Christians who have these characteristics that we read, just read? In other words, why would they uh, be so resentful or aggressively um, nasty towards somebody that's poor in spirit, somebody that's gentle or humble? Somebody that hungers for righteousness, somebody that's merciful, somebody that's pure at heart, or somebody that's peacemakers. Why would they be so aggressive and hateful towards that? You know, these people with these kind of virtues shouldn't be threatened by anybody. They shouldn't threaten anybody. They shouldn't be threatened by anybody. In fact, these virtues are what the world needs and even claims to uh, appreciate. You know, if, if you spoke of the 
most politicians, they would profess to have qualities like this. Mm -hmm. And so these are good things, aren't they? But why are we persecuted for speaking, you know, for having these virtues and following Jesus? But the truth is the world hates righteousness. And a theory that I had, you know, sort of feel that, um, that perhaps they uh, feel guilty. And you say, well, why do they feel guilty? They don't really believe, they don't, you know. But as we see in uh, Romans 1, 18 to 19, it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. So even people that don't believe and don't know God <coughs> personally, they know about God. And God has made it evident to them. He's made it evident through the world he's created for them. Um, and people have looked to find things that are just opposed to that. Like God didn't really, he can't really take care of that. We're just spinning here in space, and uh, if we uh, address climate change or that kind of thing, then we can save the world ourselves. We don't need God. But deep down inside, people do know. They do know there is a God, and they deny it, and they fight it. And I think that has a lot to do with why they are so resentful of people that are Christian. So it's not like it was even new in Jesus' day. This has been going on for a long time. And we see in Isaiah 51, 7, it says, Listen to me, you who know righteousness, a people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be dismayed at their revilings. So people back there, the prophets of God, the people really standing up for God, they were people fighting them and hating them, the people that were supposed to be following God, supposed to be God's chosen people. And here they are. Somebody is a spokesman for God, telling them what God's saying, and they're fighting them. They're against them, and they, you know, have killed a lot of them, as Jesus had said sometimes. So, this is not a new phenomenon, and we need to remember that, you know, if with the absence of God, you open up yourself to a lot of uh, satanic influences, a lot of demonic activity, a lot of those things that people don't understand that they're being deluded that they're being uh, led against God. They don't even realize a lot of times what's happening to them. And you can see in this country now that logic is out the window. Uh, there are things that their people are violently fighting for that are obviously, you know, if we had seen this like when I was a kid in that generation, people, you know, with abortion, you know, fighting for a right to abortion, a right to kill you. That's like, that would have been so absurd when I was a kid. But look at it now. Now it's these people are violently fighting for that. So there's a lot that Satan's been doing in that people that stay, that they kick God out of their lives, out of the schools, out of our country if they can do it. And uh, I guess we really shouldn't be surprised at it. That's the way things are now. So, but anyway, so how do we react to all this? You know, um, what do we do that, you know, what does the Bible tell us to do? And see, First Peter has a lot of um, things that are echoed in this, uh, in these uh, Beatitudes, in this part of, of Matthew. We see in First Peter 3, 14 to 15. But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make defense to everyone who asks you, and to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So most people, you know, when they're being ridiculed and persecuted and that, they're going to react. That's a normal human nature kind of reaction to it. You're going to start saying bad things about them, or at least uh, show your displeasure. But as Peter tells us here, um, you should act with gentleness. And, and that's, you know, you think that that's kind of like acting weakness, that if you were fought against them, that shows strength. But not, not so at all with followers of Jesus. He says that you give it, um, with an account, you know, you tell them about Jesus, tell them the truth, but you do it with gentleness and reverence, you know. So to be able to have that kind of 
control. That kind of control requires spiritual strength. And that's, you know, the kind of strength that Jesus would have us have so that we won't be like reacting um, in a nasty way to God, except that we'll, with reverence and gentleness, tell them the truth about God. And um, hopefully, you know, the Holy Spirit working through us will convince them because we can't do it all ourselves, that's for sure. So moving along, any questions on that or comments? Matthew 5, 11 and 12. And it says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So it's kind of repeating the same things, but it changes a little bit. For one thing, it changes to... Um, Jesus is now talking in the second person plural. In other words, instead of saying, blessed are they, now he's talking directly, blessed are you. And also, um, the persecution is not just the result of righteous behavior, it, as it was in the previous ones, but now it's because of a relationship with Jesus himself. It says, because of me. So it's become a, a much more personal thing in a lot of ways. It's become personal in the uh, fact that it's uh, us and Jesus. Yes, Pastor. You know, uh, and I said it before, and you all could testify to it, is that I've seen it back when I worked in my regular job. Uh, you could talk about, like at the coffee table, or at work, I mean, at the lunch table. People can mention God. People are really not offended by that. You know, and uh, you can talk about anything, astrology, and you can mention God. But I found it's when you mention the word Jesus, Jesus. Yeah. that changes everything. It's like a vampire with a cross. Yeah. It's yeah. It, they it, they don't like that, and the Bible says that that name will be an offense. It's the name of Jesus Christ yeah. that they can't stand it. That they don't know why. It, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I guess when they talk about God, it's kind of like a vague thing. A vague thing. Yeah, we all believe that God's good, God is great, and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. But when it's Jesus, it's very specific. Yeah. yeah. And there's no question about what you're talking about. Yeah. That's why the Bible says that even Satan and his followers, <laughs> the demons, they believe in God. Okay? That's not the issue. Believing in God is not what saves you. It has to do with how do you get to God. So it's that name, which is the curse word, it's the only God who's a curse word. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I guess it would, you know, it does offend people because it is opposed to a lot of, you know, what's controlling their life at that point. And it's a, it's a, I think it challenges people's uh, thoughts and, and things about God to the point where they can't, you know, they can't hide A lot of people, I think, do feel guilty. Uh, I really do. Whether they realize it or not. All right, so, um, so now it's become personal. Um, it's a matter, in a sense, of sharing Jesus' sufferings. In other words, now it's because Jesus and our relationship with him that we are sharing his sufferings, in a sense, because he's, um, he's certainly suffered more than we will, and he was, you know, perfect, he was sinless. We're not that way. Uh, hoping to become that way uh, as we grow in the Lord. But we are, in a sense, suffering in the people that are fighting against him and fighting against God and fighting against his kingdom. So uh, that's uh, a position that we are now bringing us in a somewhat way closer to him. So again, Jesus promises that our reward in heaven will be great. And uh, sometimes you would think looking for rewards, you know, was kind of a selfish thing in a sense. Um, and in a worldly way, it is. You know, you're looking for rewards for things you do. And a lot of people will do things that might seem good, but they, if they're doing it for a reward, a personal reward, that's selfish, really. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the kind of reward that Jesus 
wants us to have. He wants to give it to us. And it's a kind of reward that, um, you know, ultimately brings him yet closer to him. So this kind of reward is not something that, um, it's not a selfishly um, motivated thing. It's something that, again, we want to be servants of him and to be better servants. We want to be closer to him. And the ultimate closeness, of course, is our reward in heaven with him. So there's nothing wrong with this kind of uh, reward and desiring this reward. And sometimes we need to keep that reward in mind and close when things aren't going against us. We do have people persecuting us. And we have, you know, any hard times that we have, it's important to remember that. But especially in the case of persecution, because we need that, we need to have that strength of knowing that Jesus is with us and God is with us and that he stands by us and there is no reason to fear as we looked in the previous verses um, to fear the fact that we're being persecuted yes they can hurt us and yes these things are not um, there are things that could possibly be very very uncomfortable for us but that reward is a lot of times the thing that will hold us together when we need it the most so it is something that's important to keep together Keep it in our minds. And as we uh, noted before, this has been going on, this kind of persecution has been going on for millennia. So there were several examples, but this one in Jeremiah um, was particularly um, straightforward, and you can really see that he was going through the same kind of thing. And with close friends, you know this. It says, um, For I've heard the whispering of many. Terror on every side. Denounce him. Yes, let's denounce him. All my trusted friends watching me from my fall say, perhaps he will be deceived so we may prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread champion. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will be utterly ashamed because they have failed with an everlasting disgrace that will not be forgotten. So here, these are his trusted friends. And um, I think most of us, you know, if we turn to the Lord and we, you know, in things like our midlife or so, we had friends that were close friends before. And a lot of times, all of a sudden, they're not our friends anymore. You know, it's when we come to Jesus. And because it's something that's, again, stands up, stands out against them, uh, because it is something that is against the world. And they can't participate in that. They can't a lot of times understand that. Hopefully we speak with them and hopefully they'll uh, they'll learn and they will change, you know, and they will come to Jesus. But if they don't, a lot of times they just lose those friends and just, you know, the partying things that we might have done before and that kind of thing. Or, uh, maybe we, you know, go back to it a little bit, but we'll realize sooner or later they're not going, they're not going to give us it happens. Yes, that's no, I hate to keep on talking, but I, I, I have this, that exact thing happened, and I remember it was very interesting because I never disassociated myself with my old friends. They dissociated themselves with me because I would start, you know, let's go out, guys. I'm just not going to do this. I'm not going to smoke pot. I'm, not gonna, yeah. I'm just going to hang out with you. And they're like, well, so you're just going to hang out and not do what we do? I said, yeah, why can't I do that? And they didn't like it. Yeah, they didn't like me. Just I said I'm I'm the same guy. Why can't I just Why can't we hang out? And they stopped calling me. You know, I never stopped calling them. They stopped calling me, and for some reason, I was a downer to them. And I never judged what they were doing. I didn't say anything. I said, yeah. "This is something I'm doing, guys. Nothing with you guys. It's cool. Whatever you want to do." And they just didn't like it. I ruined the my presence there. Ruined the the, the night for some reason. Yeah, it made it a strange thing. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it suddenly became very uncomfortable. Yeah. Look at you now. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think we get angry because of your love of Christ and their feeling of self guilt. Yeah. And even though it's unspoken, yeah, it's, yeah. there's a change, and the change makes them think and what they think about them. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely right. And so that's, you know, that's the point where it becomes, you know, a division and it's just it's inevitable if they don't mm -hmm. if they don't come to Christ it just doesn't work because anymore. you know what it, it like Charlene said it, it makes them 
have to think about God and Jesus. And they don't want to. It's like, now you're making me think about this. What if I need to do this Jesus thing too? And I don't want to have to think about it. You're making me think about something I don't want to think about. Right. And I would rather you just come back to me, you know, to the old ways, and then I feel good about myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's so true. Yeah. But unfortunately, that's the way the world has gone, and uh, it's gone so far away from God and so far away from Jesus that it, it, uh, it, it has to be that way, I guess. You know, you have to go through that. So. But you keep him in prayer, and you never know. You know, you keep, you know whenever you can, if you can, can talk to them again, you never know. Maybe, the, maybe they will change. So that was covering a part of it. So um, where it says at the end they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So this has been, like I said, been going on all through the Old Testament, um, and even to the point where uh, even Moses remember, had a lot of opposition a lot of times because mm -hmm. he wanted to do what God wanted to do. We wanted him to do. Okay, so <clears throat> this um. Next verse, read the verse first. You are the salt of the earth. If the, if the salt became tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Remember, we talked about this one in the sermon last week, I guess. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was um, something that kind of makes me wonder why did he mention salt? And what, what is it about salt? And saltiness that that he's um, referring to, you know, the thing is kind of obvious. He's talking about their characteristics and their nature, and how they show that nature to the people around them, the disciples. That is, um, but salt itself. So it. Uh, I'm going to go through some verses about that are mentioned about salt in the Bible that I never thought of before, never uh, really considered. And still, truthfully, don't fully understand the implication for it all. But we go back to Leviticus 2.13. And it says, every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, so that the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings you offer, you shall offer salt. So it's talking about the salt of the covenant. And truthfully, this is a bit whole study itself. Truthfully, I don't know what that means. I don't really uh, understand the implication of salt of the covenant, but apparently it's something important in there. And same thing in 2 Chronicles 13, 5. Do you know that the Lord God of Israel gave the rule over Israel forever to David and his sons by a covenant of salt? Now that covenant was, of course, about his offspring who will have a kingdom. It's talking about the Messiah. It's talking about Jesus. Um, but why is it referred to? And this was a Rehoboam, I think, talking to Jeroboam. Well, you know, when they split up and, and the kingdom was becoming divided, and he's pointing out the fact that these promises were given for David. And, you know, so there was that separation there and that conflict. And he's saying, well, don't you understand these promises are through David? So if you're David's son, you know, we're going against him. Um, but again, um, covenant of salt. Don't really fully understand that. Um, and in Mark 9, 50, a parallel verse is, um, salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, uh, what will it make you salty again? And it has salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. Um, so that, that's a parallel verse, but the thing that's distinctive there, it says, having salt in yourself and being at, that salt will give you peace with one another. So salt, apparently at that time, has some association with, uh, with grace. And then the last one, Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. So we get the grace, um, so seasoned with salt. And salt, you know, had an implication of wisdom with it as well. So all these things with salt, um, I think I might like to go back and do a study on that so I can figure out the implications, what that really, the significance of that really is. But it's interesting, it's mentioned in so many places in, 
in the uh, offerings, in the covenant, and um, within our hearts, apparently, the soul is that same thing. <laughs> so, the other thing that I was, was curious about this is salt is sodium chloride. And it's, you know, we think of it in terms of pure chemistry nowadays. But the salt in those days was not pure sodium chloride. It was mixed with other compounds. And then we get it from places like the, you know, the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea, you know, referred to a lot as that. Um, it wasn't pure. And it had other compounds in it. So if there was more sodium chloride in it or other salty compounds that had that salty taste, you know, then it would be salty. And the saltiness was good, of course, for the taste, but it was also good for preservation. You know, it would keep things from rotting and didn't have refrigeration. So salt was very important for preserving foods um, until you could, you know, store them, until you could eat them, you know, that kind of thing. If it was slaughtered an animal, a lot of things it couldn't go land all at once. You'd have to preserve part of it. Salt was very important for that. Um, and salt could lose its saltiness, you know. Um, it could, the salt could get washed away and leave other compounds that are maybe not so soluble in water or something like that. So it wasn't until now I realized you had salt can lose saltiness uh, because of the, the way salt was at that time. But of course, the point of the whole metaphor is that um, if the disciples of Jesus lose their distinctiveness, if they lose the characteristics that make the disciples, um, then they're basically useless to the poor Lord, you know. Uh, as we mentioned last week in the sermon, you don't necessarily you're not going to lose your salvation, but you're going to use your, lose your usefulness to the Lord. And that's, you know, um, a bad thing. You know, we want to be, um, we want to be useful to God. We want to be able to do things that please God and to further his kingdom and those things. And if we don't hang on to these characteristics, you know, we lose the ability to do that because we've lost it. That important thing that we work with the Holy Spirit to gain, if we don't have that anymore, we become useless to Jesus. So, um, just something that I mean, that's the main point of this whole thing. But I still want to go back and figure out everything about salt. <laughs> still, like, I'm curious about that. Okay, so the next verse, um, 514, it says, You are the light of the world, and a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Okay, so he's telling his disciples that they and we are the light of the world. And of course, Jesus is the source of that light. The only reason we can be light is that we receive light from Jesus. Because you know, he tells us that's what we can see. Um, and the prophecy about this um, from Matthew 4 16, it was taken from um, Isaiah 9 2. It says, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land a shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. And if you go back in Isaiah, you see that this very much talked about that area in um, northern Galilee where uh, the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun were located, and where Jesus, the main part of his ministry was there. So this was very much a prophecy that was fulfilled in Jesus' first time on earth, that these people that were in darkness at that time, you know, a lot of a lot of God's people at that time were really not um, close to God, not doing what God wanted, and then Jesus came to Earth in their point, and He brought His light. He brought the light, um, the light of life, as we know. And again, in John eight twelve, Jesus tells us very straightforward. He says. Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So again, as we said, Jesus, who is the Son of God, is the source through whom the disciples become light. And of course, Jesus, you know, he points to the Father, as he always does. And, um, you know, he himself is God, the Son, he always pointing to the Father as um, who you want to worship and who you want to um, do what you do for. Um, again, always looking to the Father. And then um, in Matthew 15, it says, anyone, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, 
and it gives light to the world in the house. Every time the disciple uh, again supposed to let this light shine before men, and uh, it was that was an important thing. And uh, the obvious reference here to a lamp. Uh, when you light a lamp, now a lamp in those days was basically a bowl of oil with a wick in it, and it was a lamp itself was put on a lampstand and made to be stationary at that point, not like a torch, uh, which was made a little different and made to be carried around. This wasn't made to be carried around, it was made to be put in the spot where it would shine light most effectively. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you don't put it under a basket. Um, the other parallel verses in Mark 4.21 and Luke 8.16 also mention you don't put it under a bed, because it, you know, it doesn't make sense to do that. Why would you do that? The purpose of the light is to shine and give light where it's needed, uh, under the bed or not under a basket. So that was um, that is the point of that. It needs to be visible to the world. As the disciples, the light that they have, the uh, characteristics that they have, the virtues they have as disciples, need to be shown to the world. And the interesting part about the city set on a hill uh, cannot be hidden is that, well, even before I get to that, another implication of putting light under a basket um, is not the main thing, but it is another interesting point. That if you put it under a basket, eventually it's going to lose its oxygen and go out. So in a lot of ways, if we're not showing our light to the world, we're not sharing our light with others, a lot of times we maybe the light may go out and we go in and we may lose the, uh, the characteristics that make a good disciple of Jesus from not use. You know, it's a lot of times you, uh, well, if I were a mechanic, my pastor, I would say if you sit the car sitting in the driveway, right, and not use it all the time, it doesn't work anymore. So it, again, it needs to be, uh, needs to be shown to people and you need to share it to keep it, um, to keep it strong. So that was one other thing. Um, and the other thing about on the hill, now a city set on a hill is another, is another analogy you can make out of this, that a city on a hill, especially in those days, it was not like one big neon sign. You know, it wasn't like um, Times Square, where there's bright lights from these you know, limited number of signs. Then it would be people using these kind of lamps, and it wouldn't, if one or two people were using the lamps, yeah, not, nobody would see it from very far. You know, it was just a, it was a combination of a lot of lamps that would give this light from a distance, and you could see a city on the hill. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of an analogy there too that we're not doing this as lone people. At least we try not to be. I mean, certain situations where that happens, but we try to do it together. And you know, then the light, the cumulative light of all of those is something that people see better. And this is basically, you know, the way Jesus worked and the way the church grew. You know, it's from growing, you know, like they talk about a fire spreading, they talk about multiplying in that way. But it is a collective light that really shows the world. That's on the get this year that a lone candle can be seen from miles in that service. A lone candle can be seen from miles, what? If it's on a lake, if you look out in the field, you'll see a see a lone hill like miles. Yeah. But not like the light of the city of the hill. <laughs> that was point, yeah, right. Okay. Any questions or comments? Are there for you? Yes. Uh, I, uh, I uh, talk about this uh, light and the, there's a basket and the lampstand. Uh, believer has the light because of the connection with the Jesus. That Jesus is the source of the light. Mm -hmm. So, a uh, believer uh, should uh, uh, believer should uh, uh, expose their, themselves, their, his or he, uh, the place where is the lampstand, so that people can see our light through our through our uh, through uh, can, people can see our light that's uh, connected with the Jesus, with the source of light. So we need to the uh, put ourselves the place there is a lampstand so that we can so the light, not the basket. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then the, uh, the 
So we replace ourselves in the, in the yeah. place where we're seen. Yeah, right? that's what mm -hmm. we need yeah. to put ourselves at the end stand, not the out yeah. under the basket. Right. Yeah. So we, yeah, we need to put our, position ourselves in the yeah, sense yeah. where the lampstand is, yeah. so people say, right? Yeah. No, yes, John, I, I know every time I talk about this, I talk about it tonight, I know people get upset, but you know, today we all want to go where there's a lot of light. Like everybody wants to go down south, and when you go down south, there's a lot of Christians. Mm -hmm. And you can feel it, and there's churches everywhere, but you're not really shining that bright because there's no, there's not as much of the darkness. And deep down in our hearts, we know where do we really need to be? Yeah, exactly. Where the darkness yeah. is. Yeah. And, but, as, but we want to get away from the darkness too, and I, I remember going to Tennessee, one of my favorite states in the whole country, and going, wow, there's churches everywhere. You go to the store, there's hymns, music, Christians are everywhere, and you feel it. So, and I want to go there, we want to go there, but God says, okay, so what are you going to do there? Everyone's already saved. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's like, oh, man. <laughs> but I don't want to be where the darkness is, but that's where Jesus went. Right? He didn't yeah. go where... The righteous were. He even says that. He right. goes where the sinners were. You know, and that's the battle that we all face because selfishly, I don't want to get away from the darkness. I know. I mean, <laughs> I'd like to bask in the light. But that's true. When you look at you know, that, what they talk about in Zebulun and Naphtali, there, in that land, people were sitting in darkness. I and mean, that's where Jesus had his ministry. Yeah. So, yeah, it's true. We do need to do that, that's for sure. But uh, it is not very hard to. Uh, deliver position in the dark uh, dark position because the uh, people always though I am going to uh, comfort you not the hard job it always we feel like that no uh, I'm going I'm not going to the trap uh, position because there is a lot of thing happen a lot of uh, struggle there but always we comfort to know there is a uh, comfort journey and place there we go to the easy place easy like, place like, yes exactly. <laughs> I agree <laughs> That's true, and this uh, whole thing about, you know, with the persecution and everything, in the dark place, that's going to happen, you know, and uh, we don't like that. That's just, you know, that's just natural. You're gonna, that's, that's the thing, that's the problem, is you're going to stand out in the darkness if you're a Christian, you know. Yeah. If you go down to Tennessee, you're not going to stand out because everybody's a Christian, yeah. you, know, well, right. you know, or claims to be anyway. Yeah. 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 I fantasize about that, too. <laughs> Okay, so then the, um, the last verse for today, <clears throat> Matthew 5, 16, it says, Let your shi light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And uh, again, in Peter, very parallel verse here, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slam you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they deserve, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So our behavior um, needs to reflect the things that Jesus says we should do, the characteristics we should have, as he outlined, right in the beginning of the sermon and the Beatitudes. And these should be men should see these. They should uh, be done so that people see them. Um, and in this other verse, it says, even when it's slandered, you need to be steadfast in doing those good works. And the reason we do this is um, not just to make the world a better place or have people emulate us, but as it says, to give glory to the Father in heaven, to your Father in heaven. And we do see, if you recall, in Matthew 6, 1, it almost sounds like a contradiction here on this, you know, just on the surface, where beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them, otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So what's the distinction here? Um, should we be showing these our good works in front of people, or should we not? Um, and I think the very key of the distinction... Why we do it. That's why we do it, exactly. Why do we do it, yeah. Right? Motivation. And that's, and that's not an easy thing for us always to discern. And not an easy thing for us to always um, be doing purely for the glory of God. And if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we have 
And same with Judith for the for the glorified God the Father. But we a lot of times when we have something in, inside of us that kind of you know would like it to make us look good too. And it's hard for us to distinguish and to always stay where we really are doing it for the glory of the kingdom. And it'll come to show sometimes when it's something that's not going to make you look good, something that's going to have people resent you, even Christians you will know, resent you, like you may point something out um, or do something that somebody else didn't like when you did it or something. And you know that that's going to not make you a popular person, but it's good for God's kingdom and you do it anyway. Um, and that's not easy. And that's something that we continuously need to pray about, need to examine ourselves, and we need to pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us to do that. Yes, but you know, John, that's a great, great point. That it's not just out there, because we see it in the church all the time. If there's a Christian in the church who's doing more, the Christians who are doing less can resent that Christian. Well, who do they think they are? They got to do everything just right. And then you could get persecution from people right in the church who, who feel less because you're doing more. Mm -hmm. So instead of going, wow, that's an example, they, instead of being looking for that, well, I want to be more like that, they will resent you and because you make them look less. And they say, well, who do they think they are? They're a little super Christian here. <laughs> we can never win. <laughs> <laughs> Human nature, you know, love Human nature is just the best. <laughs> yes. uh, some, that's why I think God says we have to try all the time to do whatever we do is for Him. And then it becomes like we don't even think about it, and people say, wow. And then you didn't even realize that you were doing something that was, you know, because it became. You try, you've been doing it, you know, mm -hmm. for the glory of God. Not that you're perfect, though, I'm not saying that. But it becomes something that you live, and then you forget that you're doing what God wants you to do. And mm -hmm. people notice, wow, you, you do something, you're different. And I yeah. think that's what we have to, after a while, it has to grow, like God's way grows in us. Right. I, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but no, I you know what yeah. I mean. It's like it just, and then you don't even realize. You know, am I trying to prove something? No, God is is working in me and, and making me do these things, and I didn't even realize I'm glorifying Him. Yeah, you know, that's a good so, place to be. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and we strive for that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's, it's, it's all Him. It's far. all Him. I know. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, uh, this is very important to distinguish the good works. What good works? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this can be uh, the uh, unbeliever world, unbeliever people, they think the good works uh, for the salvation. Mm -hmm. They think that the, by the good works we may earn the salvation. Mm -hmm. Unbeliever world, sometimes because by is, uh, Islam and the Hindus, they think the uh, good works is the, for the salvation. We get the salvation through this. This is the another distinguishing. Uh, distinguish matter and uh, other three or two is that sometimes people think that oh I am doing good works uh, for show myself is I am a very important person mm -hmm. and do a lot of things that's the way uh, my people sometimes uh, good, good works uh, look like uh, yeah. but uh, uh, good works is the as the as we are the believer is should be the glorified to God right that's the uh, that's the distinction Right. That's done very important. Yeah, that's another thing. The good works for salvation. And a lot of Christian places, they, they may not say that particularly, but a lot of things they do that. They do think that they can earn their way to heaven and you know, earn salvation. And that's, that's another word. Mm -hmm. Another thing we need to make clear that it does not, yeah. it's not how we earn. It's only through Jesus' sacrifice that we have salvation, not through our works. Anybody else? All right, let's look to the Lord in word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this time, Lord. We thank you that we can examine ourselves, Lord, that we know we know what you tell us and teach us, Lord, but to bring it into our hearts that really have it um, be our, our only motive, Lord, is something we need to work through in our whole lives, Lord. And we 
we pray that as we try, Lord, and we look and examine ourselves and we expose things about ourselves, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would uh, show us and also guide us and encourage us, Lord. And, uh, and as we grow in you, Lord, we, we pray that we become closer and closer as we do this process. We thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Good study, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.